Neville is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education at Deakin University. Um, but you will have seen from Pauline's presentation the fine curriculum mapping tool that Pauline and UWS rather adapted for their curriculum mapping process. Well, Deadly is actually the author of that tool. Um, so you already know something about her work. She's been the holder of two, not one, but two ALTC fellowships. Um, and I think uh, is well known and celebrated around the Australian teaching and learning community as one of its champions. So it's my pleasure to introduce Beverly Oliver. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes. I'm doing my best teacher voice here. Can we make this really interactive and stuff? You know? No talking <laughs> until I finish my slides. <laughs> I was really tossing up as to whether I would be, I hope I'm not being insulting by mentioning engineering. I was given the title Engines for Change and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I'd like to talk about a whole range of things this afternoon and particularly how to influence <coughs> change, how to influence policy change and so on. So I'm going to cover a whole pile of stuff, is that all right? Cover, that's a bad word, should have said that. Okay, so. <coughs> I think we're desperately in need of change, and I'm sorry I'm going to be angry for this thing because I've got to, this is the only way I can do it. So I'll probably stand back here. But I thought I would frame it this way and maybe talk about why students enrol, what students learn, how students learn, and how we know they learn. Because I think they're the key questions that should influence any change. They're not always the questions that influence policy agendas, unfortunately. Often the greatest influence is the capital letter S with a line straight down the middle. <laughs> that would be a dollar. So this to me is what it's all about. I think because you're an associate dean teaching and learning, there's a very good chance that you're not in it for the money. <laughs> there's a very good chance that you're a very good teacher and that you're passionate about what you do. And it's not necessarily uh, like my own job, really. It, it's about influencing change and not necessarily having a lot of people <coughs> who can kind of boss around very much. We're influencers. We're part of the conversation. I think we always have to stick to what's really important core values, I'm going to come back at that to the, at the end, but I think these are the core values for me. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning, because you know life in a university can be pretty hard at times, or is it just me? <laughs> you know, there's politics, oh well, probably not where you are, but you know, <laughs> there's politics, there's competing agendas, there's all sorts of things going on in thought. In, in fact, I thought I would mention that to start with. I think we're a sector under stress. Probably every, every sector is going to say that. But let's have a moment for ourselves. I think we're a sector. Or do you think? You think? Yeah. What's the stress? This is the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the stress stressors are? I've got some, but let's hear what More students, think. less dollars. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? More administrivia. Yep. Time. Yes, and lack of it. Mm -hmm. Better outcomes. Your pressure to produce outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And more scrutiny, I think. Big brother is Big brother, yes. Uh, is that what you call regulation? Mm. Yeah. Competing demands yeah. from various DVCs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone in particular, Viral? <laughs> <laughs> All four. All four. <laughs> right. Similar being more things to more people. Industrial conditions, academic workloads, profiles, expectations of communities and employers. I think we're coming under increasing scrutiny, particularly by professional bodies. They're getting more active. They're saying what they want, what they don't want. Research focus, the demographics. That was a very polite way of saying no one in this room, but there is an aging workforce apparently. <laughs> well, it's true. When you try to get people to change and they know they're five years or three years from retirement, it's like, la, 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 la. tell someone who's interested, I won't be here. Why should I? I'll just keep my head down. And there is a large group of, shall I say, us, not all of us, but many of us, who are 
in that zone, if you like, in the last five to ten years? Where are the new academics coming from? Why are they not coming? Why doesn't everyone want to be like us? This is a whole thing that's challenging the workforce. Funding and business models, and I'll put the next one there because I, as I said to someone just before lunch, I'll have to mention MOOC somewhere because <laughs> it's just so groovy and hyped up. <laughs> I even heard someone say before we went to lunch, so, you know, the MOOCs are coming, the MOOCs are coming. <laughs> well, actually, it's not about the MOOCs. I think there's a lot of disruptive technology. It's causing a lot of disruption and new business models. And I'd like to talk more about that and how we can actually use that to our advantage. We've got campuses. What does that mean? I know you know what that means, but you know, we've got large, expensive campuses. Deakin has four. We have on-campus students and off-campus students, and sometimes the on-campus students actually do come on campus. <laughs> and when they do come on campus, sometimes they sit in the library and watch the eye lecture while the lecture's going on. I know, it's curious. That's young people for you. You know what I'm saying? It's a whole new ball game, and we're retrofitted to a different model. So I think we're up for a lot of disruption and a lot of competition from private, and I would suspect with digital, the digital thing coming, some people say tsunami, avalanche, you know, can I think of another, you know, hyperbole word. With all of the things that are changing, and I think they will, I think we could be in for some international competition as well. Because I think the globe could get quite small, but you know, maybe not. But I think things will change. They won't be just the 1970s campus plus 30 years. Oh, sorry, 43. Because, you know, a lot of what we do is predicated on what was happening then. For example, the legislation that we live by, the volume of learning, you know, spend about three years getting a bachelor's degree. Why? Because it's predicated on turning up to three lectures a week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, and they're all an hour and da 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 da. And you can only go that fast, so it slows you down. But if you could get through a lot faster, as you probably could, why can't you go faster? Well, we have that legislation that says volume of learning. We have the 75% um, rule of on-campus and off-campus, or online, and so on, to keep us in the internationalization, in the international student zone. You know what I'm talking about? We're sort of all predicated on stuff. But the campus and the cloud really are not that different these days. I'm going to refer to what we're doing at Deakin, obviously because it's what I know best. And I just wanted to share with you this, which is the byline for the teaching and learning part. LIV is actually an acronym. Learning, ideas, values, and experience. L is the one I'm interested in, really. Al is the one that Deakin is interested in, I would have to say. Deakin's got a very good growing research reputation. Very good, I would say. And that's the I for ideas. The L, though, is, I think in, a, in its heart, Deakin is very much a teaching institution, which is, it's a pleasure to be there. And this is what the byline is, and it's something I can sign up for. We actually made it up ourselves. We didn't pay anyone to make that out. <laughs> but no, it's amazing. We could it spin, I guess. But a, a brilliant education is what we think it's all about. Brilliant. Education. And it's not just for jobs, but we are very strong on employability because we know that's what counts. Where you are and where you want to go, geographically, um, intellectually, career-wise, whatever it is. We thought that sort of worked for us, so I'm going to refer to that a bit. And if you pull out the two pillars that we're focusing on, it's these two things. Evidence, which I'll come back to, for graduate employability and personal engaging and relevant learning wherever that happens to be. So I'm just giving you a bit of a background here. But before we move on, I'll talk, I'll move to that question, which is one of the four ones I really wanted to focus on. Why do students enrol? Because that's the whole thing, isn't it? Why do they come here in the first place? What are their expectations? So we're going to talk about meeting their expectations. We ought to know what they are. Why do students <coughs> Do you need a moment to think about this? Well, apparently, someone very famous and clever said there's actually three M's is the answer. It's not me, I didn't make this up. But you knew that. Do you know what the three M's are? Mind, money, and marriage. 
<laughs> That's why students come to university. Mind, <laughs> money, career, and marriage. It's a dating agency. And that sort of covers it. Who was the rich and famous person who said that? Not rich, famous. He works in higher education, sorry. <laughs> Simon Margins from University of Melbourne. And I heard someone quote him the other day. <coughs> so if, there, if they are the things, mind, money, and marriage, <coughs> we paraphrase it that way. The dating agency part can't do much. You're on your own with that, students. But the mind and the money, I think we have a lot to contribute to because it is your education and it is your the beginning of your career or the continuation of your career. I often say it's about people come to uni to get a job, keep a job or get a better job. And that probably captures it for many students. So I'm going to start from here and all the while I'm thinking of your role as an ADTL because I'm going to come back to this. I think we need a model for teaching and learning. And just to keep you on your toes after lunch, UBD would be? Used by date. Well done, well done. This is a model past its used by date. And that would be how I started teaching, really. In the 1970s, at the age of nine years of age. <laughs> what, what, what's the content? How many times will I stand up and do this? How will I test it, mark it, grade it, and so on? And really, this is the legacy that we still have. And we constantly judge student success by this. And I think this is really a very big part of our problem. The government is very focused on standards, but when they talk about standards, they tell us which numbers they'll judge us on. And we judge students on numbers. There's a magic number to get in. It's called the ATAR or something similar. And there's usually a mark when you get out. And if you get the 50, good on you, you've passed. We don't always know what the 50 means. You know I'm talking about a hypothetical 50% type thing. So, you know, in your unit, if someone does get 50, and I heard someone just before lunch talking about the minimum standards, if someone does get 50, which half did they not get? <coughs> which half of the unit called how to land a very large airplane on a very small <laughs> runway did they not get? <laughs> I jest, but only slightly. So what is this model? Well, it's content teaching, testing, I call it the teaching testing model or the talking and testing model, because we do talk. And it's the ad hoc improvement of units model, because my unit, I taught first year for a very long time. My unit taught it, taught it, taught it, fixed it up, mucked around with it, changed it, added this, took that away. What was the rest of the course? Don't know, don't care. Didn't even know who taught it, really. And that's just what the culture was and probably is in many of our institutions. I think moving to a course or degree <coughs> focus, that's what I mean, a degree, makes a huge difference because it gives you the student's eye view. It's the course experience questionnaire thing. So that's what we're trying to do. I hope you didn't look away then <laughs> because something moved on the slides. Oh, you did? No, you've got to pay attention. <laughs> the evidence has gone to number two. Now, I might have that the wrong way around, but I think we should focus more on the evidence. And the evidence is really the compelling thing for me, and I'd like to talk about your TLOs shortly. But if we go to those four questions, what students learn, how we know whether they learn, how students learn, and how can we enable student success, I think the ADTL has a leading role to play in all of that. And that's about outcomes, and expectations, assessment and evidence, the experience that students have when they learn, and I don't mean outside the classroom, I'm really talking about inside the classroom, whatever the classroom is. And then the systematic enhancement of courses using curriculum mapping tools and all that sort of stuff. So these are the, the things that I think we can use. These are the levers for change, I think. So I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on these if that's okay. So what students learn is really around the outcomes and standards, and I think they go together. We used to call them graduate attributes, we still do sometimes. That's kind of the generic batch that your university's got on its marketing thing. And then you will translate those, I'm sure, into your TLOs or your course learning outcomes or whatever it is that you're going to call them. So I think they are really, really important. But 
when the government talks to us and talks about standards, we tend to talk about these things. We tend to talk about counting numbers. Marks, grades, credits, time, completion rates, pass rates. All the other proxies that you know come from the National Data Questionnaire about two years after the questions were asked, by the way. In this century, how could that possibly happen? Good teaching, according to how students were feeling that day. Generic skills, overall satisfaction. Satisfaction, that's an interesting one. If you had to choose between really satisfied students and students who had the capabilities they needed to get on in life, which one would you pick? Wow. I know which one I would go. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It's nice that they're happy. Good. Not happy? I hope we're not giving you a horrible time. And we should absolutely treat students absolutely well and properly. But satisfied as in happy, 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 it's not really about that. I want them to be slightly unsatisfied, slightly on the edge of their chair, slightly, well, not slightly, a lot, challenged. You know, this is hard. Ooh, you're asking me to do this stuff. Good. That's called value for money. That's mind, money, not money, probably not marriage. <laughs> okay, so what else could we count? Well, I think we need to count the things that do count. And the, this is what counts for me. We're in the game of producing employable and educated contributing citizens. It's very hard to count this. And I think this is where we all stumble. So we have this. This is the Australian Qualifications Framework chocolate wheel. That was a joke. <laughs> it looks like a chocolate wheel. It's not. It's trivial pursuit. It's trivial. Oh, sorry, <laughs> ninth century. Okay, it's trivial pursuit. <coughs> so we have a qualifications framework. It's kind of in the standards. Maybe it's going to fall out of the standards. Maybe it's only going to be a reference point. I'm really glad we've got the AQF. Well, let's face it. We've had it for a while. We've just been pretending it wasn't there. But we're going to pay a bit more attention to it now, and particularly this. This, for me, as a leader of change in teaching and learning, really helps me. Why? Well, to quote Paul Keating from several, several years ago, it's L-A-W. It's written in there. We have to actually show evidence of this now. This is a good lever for change. Because it says, don't just say you've got graduate attributes. Put your money where your mouth is and show us the evidence. Show us your, the evidence. Your students really can do that stuff. Does that ring a bell with you? So I actually reference this kind of stuff very frequently with teaching staff, because those are the people at the chalk face that we are persuading. Our job is to change hearts and minds, not just with students, but particularly with our colleagues, influencing people to change their hearts and minds. So this makes it really important to have a nice set of those things. They're Deacon's graduate learning outcomes, we've called them, because it matches the language of the AQF. So we've gone away from the attributey thing. Attributes to me are a little bit vague and sound like the nice to haves in, in life. These are the things the government is telling us now that we are required to evidence. Whether we like that or not, or whether we think that's just the students' good luck if they have those things. Some people have even suggested that we as teaching staff should even be able to model these things ourselves. Ooh. But it's true, isn't it? We probably should. However, we should really focus on getting our students to evidence them. But this is where we start. This is where we go back to yesterday's model, I think, in teaching and learning. Because that's the next question. <coughs> How do we test and measure them? Well, we can't. Some of those things you can't test and measure, and you shouldn't. Can anyone dream up a test for me, please, for global citizenship? Actually, a multiple choice test, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a good global citizen? Yes, no, maybe, don't care. <laughs> Which one would be the answer? Can't test students for that. So what do you do? So what to do? Forget it, move on, go back to testing knowledge. No, I think we can evidence these things. Because I think our responsibility in this age, and the previous ones, by the way, was for our graduates to leave university prepared for the world of employability and engagement and to leave with a portfolio of evidence that they can do these things. So I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to use another overhyped word, 
that we need to flip that assessment question. There you go. I said flip. Right, what would that be? We need to flip that question. Let's though talk about your science threshold standards. And I just took this from the video on your website, your Teaching Learning Centre website, which I have to say is very impressive, well done. So I just took the large generic ones, and I know that you're all working on discipline ones. And if we look through some of those, we actually come to that thing, how do we test and measure? So I looked at the little video that Liz and John appear in, and this comes up at the end. And I have one slight anxiety about the question. I'll let you read it. You've all watched this video, haven't you? Liz is take watching to see if you're counting. <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched this seriously? Have you seen this little seven minute video? It's very good. What evidence do you have to demonstrate student, you know, because the ALTC project they did, they took some anonymous work, asked the teaching staff, are you really confident that you're teaching these students? Yes, 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 got it covered. Beautiful, took the assignment, couldn't find the evidence. Have I got it? Yeah. Right. And that was the question at the end. Here's another one. So here's, Liz, it's actually Jenny. Oh no, that's Jenny, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just thought you'd had a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the staff were not demonstrating that the students had met the standards. Can, is, that, is that jarring with anybody? Not? It's not jarring with you. Sure. The you mean by jarring. I think so. I think it's the student's job, yeah. not yours, not the teaching staff. So I found the video just that little bit a bit teacher-centric and they say, I don't think it's our responsibility. I don't think it's our job to give ourselves more work. The students need to demonstrate the standards. In the end, of course, our courses, we need to be able to pull evidence and show that our students, yes. But ultimately, it's the students' responsibility. We're turning these people into, or helping them become or improve, to be employable, educated citizens. They're the ones who are going to go for the job interview. Well, they've got to know what they know and what they don't. So, that would be my suggestion. How do we know whether students learn or not? Let's ask a different question. How do students evidence those things? And how can they do that? Well, one of the things we're trying to do at Deakin is have a portfolio approach to assessment. Some people say e-portfolio, and e-portfolios can be good tools. I tend not to say e-portfolio because it's like saying e-paper or my computer or something, no, it's just a portfolio. We'll presume it's digital, because it could be a LinkedIn site. It could be wherever scientists curate their professional presence online in the future, whatever their particular professional group is. Nurses might go to a particular professional area on the web, that might be where you meet nurses or something like that, you know, where you connect with your discipline group. Many of us, though, are on LinkedIn. Who's on LinkedIn here? Right. Our graduates probably will be on LinkedIn as well. I would like to see every graduate in this deacon have a LinkedIn site. I'm pretty sure they've all got a Facebook site. That's for mucking around in. I would love them to have a professional presence online and to know how to be safe and secure and professional and what to put there. And I just saw this morning someone sent me a link to say, LinkedIn is now asking you or offering to let you upload some portfolio evidence. It had to happen. At the moment, LinkedIn is just like a bit of a CV with pictures, but it will come. And there are many tools around where these portfolios are actually the students, not the universities. And that's the big problem. When we have a walled garden learning management system with an e-portfolio in it, students can't lug their stuff along with them. It's kind of stuck in there. And they're not going to keep coming back and getting it, probably. They need to be responsible for it, create it, curate it, keep it up to date like we all do. That would be the LinkedIn page. So we think we need to focus on that kind of assessment. I have to say, I just think we need to focus on assessment. I would say we have to reinvent assessment. I'm going to talk about this in relation to the MOOC that we're um, starting ourselves at Deakin shortly because we're doing a little experiment with it. So it's another example of what you as a leader in teaching and learning can do, which is actually go and do a little prototype. Show people what you mean by this. How do you reinvent assessment? And if you're doing it in a MOOC, it's quite a white knuckle experience, I have to say. It's not like creating an assessment inside the classroom or a learning management system. So, 
There are some technologies that might help us with that, but we think the learning model and that pedagogical framework should dictate, guide us as to what technologies we might use because we're going to drive ourselves mad using every latest whiz-bang, and I don't talk about analytics. There's another overhyped word, I think. Apps, analytics, tools, and there are heaps of them. It's fantastic. But let's have a bit of pedagogical framework so we know which ones we want and which ones we don't. Because we might find ourselves using things just because they're there. And that wouldn't be helpful because we might find it's actually giving us yesterday's teaching and learning model. Teaching, talking, testing. Am I making any sense? Or have you all gone for snooze? Sure? Not yet. Not yet. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Okay. So, portfolios, digital badging. That might be something that could be interesting. Where you actually, and I'll show you an example of this, you actually can use this technology to give someone a digital token to show that you are warranting their learning. So if you have a LinkedIn page, have, you, have people been endorsing you lately? It's nice, isn't it? What does it mean? Yeah. Who are those people anyway? Your buddies. I don't know a lot of them, but I'm, I'm very flattered. But, you know, I'm very flattered that all three of them have endorsed me. <laughs> and I didn't have to pay them very much either. However, so digital badging is a little bit like that, but it's actually based on evidence. I'll show you what I mean. Can I ask, how do you know that the work you're badging is the student's work, not someone else's? I'll come back to that at about 5 o'clock to 9. Thanks, 6 over 3. Yeah, Qantas Club, you're on. Okay, no, seriously, how do I know it's theirs? Well, let me ask you a question, Mac. So would it be fair to say that sometimes we give people exams in, like, supervised places so we can make sure it's their work? Does that always work? How do we know when people cheat? Let me put this to you. Let me rephrase the question. You didn't give me that answer. No, no, no. I'm not going to. Sorry. It's your turn. Next <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Just tell yeah. It's all right. Mostly we do know. Ah, good answer. Mostly we do know. I put this to you. We know when we catch them. There's no real way of being really, 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 truly, truly sure that the person doing the assessment is actually the person you're marking. I think supervised exams in rooms, we probably catch them most of the time. Although some of the questions we're forced to ask them are probably not very realistic. You know what I'm saying? But I would have to say, as someone who's taught for many years, I have marked more ass essays written by the mums and dads of Australia <laughs> <laughs> than I care to think about. And actually, you know what? A lot of units, certainly at my university and postgraduate, a lot of units have no exams. So how do I know who wrote all that stuff or made that stuff? Even if it's a multiple choice test in a learning management system. I have a colleague, not at my current university of course, but another one, who regularly has 40% multiple choice test quizzes as part of their assessment. Won't give them up. Why would that be? Because they're such a pedagogically sound that would be cutting down my workload of marking tool. We have no idea who does those tests. It's 40%. I've just logged in. There you go. I'll give you 10 bucks. Do it for me. You know? There is no perfect way to know. How do you know your colleagues do the work themselves? Ah, because no one else would be silly enough to do it. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about a guy I read about this year in the paper. You may have seen this too. He was a computer programmer, worked in America somewhere. He was the best, he was the star of the office, the most productive, brilliant. There was some security, and they realized that there was a lot of hits from China, and it was always to his computer. He had outsourced his work to China. He was paying them about 10% of what he got paid, and they were pinging back all the code in the programming. Now, they had a dilemma. Do we sack him or promote him? <laughs> <laughs> because he is, for his salary, we're getting all this work done. So, okay. Second of 10 people in from China. <laughs> right, but that was a good middle manager. And he was also very clever, very entrepreneurial. So I don't think there's any, any a, a real way of doing it, except this might help. This might help. 
So if that were your, if those were your graduate learning outcomes in your discipline, and that was a course degree overview, and that was the student's dashboard, those things lined up there might represent something like digital tokens, badges, whatever you want to call them, and they might actually link to artifacts. So to answer your question, how do I know it's that person? Let's say that's communication skills, and when I click on that, I get a one or two minute video of that person speaking English. They still could get someone else to do it, I guess. But you know, we can get better evidence these days. And you don't want everything in one minute videos, I get that. And this wouldn't be all the evidence you had. But it might actually just balance things up a bit. I don't think we should get rid of marks, grades and credits, but I think we've got to calm down a little bit on those marks, grades and credits. I think it's a game and we've learnt to play the game and our students have learnt to play the game. So, the learning, what kind of experience? What kind of connected student have we got? These are sort of things we probably should be focusing on using maybe those sorts of tools. But let's talk about that. How do students learn? What's the best learning experience you ever had? If you think back to university, secondary school or primary school, and your best learning experience. Hands up if that was a textbook. Hands up if that was a website. I oh, know, it was a PowerPoint slideshow. No, it was a person. It was a teacher? Someone who knew your name, or maybe not. Someone who inspired you, challenged you, believed in you, loved their subject, knew their stuff, gave you feedback. Is that right? Have I missed anything? Yeah, outside you of all institutions. Extra lessons, <coughs> yeah. Lessons. And, and, and experience, an opportunity. Yeah. And, and just, they were there in the background. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Actually, just teaching others. Teaching others. <coughs> when I taught others, I learned more. That was the best way to teach. I did it all the way through my teaching career because I was like on the page ahead of the students. <laughs> teaching them myself as I went <coughs> in my early part of my career, of course. I think biologists would say field trips, where you not only have experts in the field, but peers, yeah. other students that you would travel with. Well, if it's events that you remember from secondary school, it's probably the day you messed around in class or put on a play or did all those other things. It's where you actually mix with people. And I think that's our challenge, is to replicate that kind of thing. It probably was face-to-face, -face, but in the future, and even now, Maybe it's going to be face-to-face -face in the cloud. This is where we have a problem, because we're coming to online learning, and usually our shoulders sink at this point. I don't know about you, but when I look at learning online things, even MOOCs, there we are, I've said it again, my shoulders do tend to slink a bit, because there's no such thing as a different student. They're on, they're off, they're on today, they're off in the next five minutes. I know students, not at my own university of course, who actually go home because the Wi-Fi is better there than it is on campus and they don't really need to be doing. Because institutions, schools and universities are never going to be able to keep up with the technology that students actually have in their handbags now or their, their satchels or whatever it is. And the Wi-Fi that's ubiquitous at home for many students, not all, but many. So we have a bit of a problem because we have expectations and we have to remember it's actually about both. There is one of Australia's best teachers. Who knows who he is? And if you don't, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know who he is? Yeah, but you're not asking me. Okay. <laughs> All right, Pauline. Is it someone else? All right. right. Go on. Roy Tasker. It's Roy Tasker from UWS. Not of Deakin, unfortunately. I've tried, but he won't come. No, he's good. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever heard Roy speak. He was the Prime Minister's award winner a couple of years ago. He's fabulous. Great teacher. Now, I think he's a great teacher, whether a student sees him like that or whether he looks like that. Because I don't know about you, but I'm speaking to my family more like that. If I'm not near them, there's FaceTime, Skype, Link, whatever we're using. There's all sorts of stuff. So I think this is the way we're going to be interacting with students in the future, and I think it's about actually making the content, the contact and the face-to-face. -face. I just thought I would share with you because this is around student expectations and experience. The rich digital habitat that our students are living in. This is not one of our students, this is me, middle-aged. So in my life, my world is me going to the bank, listening to music, getting slaughtered with friends, watching a bit of telly, reading the paper, 
playing a game. I don't play games, but I just thought I'd put that there to look pretty. That's a, it's a, a game called Disease or something, Contagion or something. This one I have to share with you. This is called GP to You. It's Australian. You log in and it'll say, very close to you, there are this many doctors, right, in fact, you can see the time. I did it today at 12.16 in S Sydney CBD. Look how many psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> and guess how you're going to talk to them on Skype. And if they are more than 15 kilometres from your home, you can have an appointment now on Skype and you pay on credit card and you can claim it on Medicare. You heard it here. <laughs> so if you think face-to-face -face in the car is not coming to a university near you, that's the doctor's surgery that you no longer have to sit in in the waiting room. Okay, they need to stitch up your hand. It's not going to be so good on Skype. Right? <laughs> but if you've just got the flu or lots of things that you, it takes you a day to get an appointment, and go, <coughs> there you are, GP to you. The world is changing very rapidly. I thought I'd show you this too. Um, here's another one, Visify. <coughs> I gave it my LinkedIn credentials and Twitter credentials, not Facebook, just my professional stuff, and it just showed me that. That's me, that's where I've lived. Oh boy, it was a bit scary. That's what I talk about. There's a quote from me, that's what I do, that's what I do, da, da, da. and it's all visual and groovy, and it's very, very simple. It just reads it. So this is the habitat our students are used to. Way more groovy than that. And then they log on to uni. So I think as teaching and learning <laughs> leaders, we have a problem, Houston, because our learning management systems pretty much look like this. And table of contents kind of jars with me, but that's what the learning management system at my university says. I know you can doll them up and they can look a whole lot better than this, but a lot of online learning is what we're doing. Upload, download, PDF, PowerPoint. And I put that big red circle right there for you, Simon Pike. Quizzes. Why are you picking on me? Because I know your name and I heard you say multiple choice quizzes. Once. <laughs> Why do we have so many multiple choice quizzes? Because They're it's easy. There. It's a tool. And anyone can make up a quiz. You don't need to know anything about making multiple choice questions, <laughs> do you? It's actually quite a science. Absolutely. But you can, anyone can make a quiz. So this is what we've got. We have work to do. So I'm going to talk now about an example that you might like to think of in your own role as an ADTL about giving people, with all of that backdrop, an example prototype, an idea of what the future could be like, because I think that's our role, is to paint a vision for the future and help our colleagues persuade them to change their hearts and minds and come on the journey, even if they are five minutes from retiring. I think this, is, this MOOC thing is overhyped, but it has given us permission to experiment, and it's given us permission to try new things. So does anyone know what MOOC stands for? Massively open online courses. No, you're massive open. <laughs> I think a lot of them are. I think they're tomorrow's technology for yesterday's pedagogy. I've even seen someone being filmed in obviously an empty room behind this thing with the PowerPoints behind them. It's it's still a lecture, I'm sorry. It's still just talking at people. And then there's a test and there's a quiz. And this is where it all falls down. So, I painted this picture. This is the sort of thing we want to do at my university. So what we're going to do is we've made our own little work. And it's coming to a place near you anytime soon. I'd like to show you an example of how this evidencing capability <laughs> thing might work. So on this little bespoke learning management system, and we're only doing it for this one unit, it's not going to become our new learning management system. At least we've got a working model of something that might work, but it might not. It's an innovation, we're trying it. The learning journey is to straight across the top of the screen. Learn, engage, network with your peers out beyond the university, because that's where the big world is. Evidence your learning and get credit for it. That's a move, we're not giving university credit. There's more to that story in a minute. But let me just give you a quick look. So it's about aggregating. Five minute, in, five minute intro here, TED Talks, other stuff. It all has to be copyright free. So we've had to really think about the content. 
The subject is humanitarian responses to 21st century disasters. Big topic. So this is something we've gone with. When you go to engage, oh, before I go there, a simulation, things you can do online, not just PDFs, engaging, discussion forum, ask, agree, challenge. We didn't make this up. The little company that we're working with, Janison, actually designed this little system. We made the buttons across the top and some of the pedagogy underneath. <laughs> in your network, this is what I can't see in my, in my university's learning management system. My link to Facebook, my link to uh, LinkedIn. These are my digital badges. I'll come back to those in a minute. This is my portfolio. This is who I am, da 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 But I could be anyone, inside or outside the university. We're asking students, and this is the crunchy bit, so I'll spend a minute on this. Designing assessment for the MOOC. This is an open and free thing. Who's going to do assessment unless they've got absolutely no social life? Who's going to sit there and do assessments? People who are keen, obviously. But we don't want to do testing. Not teach, talk and test. So we're saying, here are the standards, here are the outcomes. We, we suggest you do a review or an analysis or this or that. Make an exhibit. Make us a learning exhibit. In other words, give us some evidence that you can do those things in this kind of format, essay, writing, whatever it is. What we're doing then is we're saying to the students, here are the learning outcomes, and when you upload that evidence, you can apply for some peer credit. Now, we're only doing peer credit and peer assessment in the MOOC. Clearly, we're not giving away teacher credit. This is free. We would never be able to manage it. It's an experiment. But if it works, it's the sort of thing we'd like to put inside the university. So what happens is a peer comes along. There's a one-page rubric. There's the standards. If they think the person demonstrates those standards, and it's got to be really clear language, not too difficult, because it's voluntary, they can give them a badge. So when they apply for a badge, it's grayed out. When they actually get a badge, or feedback, or both, because you don't have to give someone a badge, it's a Deakin Connect badge, not Deakin <coughs> University credit badge, because credit is what we sell. So that's the new business model. So that's a little example of showing an idea and trying it, but being honest and saying, this may not work. It's an experiment. Let's see how it goes, and I'll tell you how it goes. We've built it on the evidence. We've built it on the literature. So there is a difference here between the MOOC and the business model. So basically, you can do the whole thing for free. When you, if you want to, cross the line, apply to Deakin University, and we will formally assess two of your exhibits and two more things that we'll get you to do. And then if you're successful, and by the way, you've paid us some dosh, we will credit you with the first unit of the degree into which that feeds. So we're trying a new business model. Um, again, that's an experiment. Let's see what happens. It's going to drive different behaviours. So that's what that's about. You may like to have a look. It may be a MOOC, it may be a TOOC, it may be a SOOC, it may be ma massive, small or tiny. <laughs> the size is not what matters in this case. <laughs> what we're trying to do is test an assessment model. Because we can talk, cajole, persuade, but some, it's really, really hard to get people to change their assessments. And I think I caught snippets of, in, of conversation just before lunch about getting people to change their assessments. And I do think we probably have to renovate or reinvent. Start with the outcomes. Start with the standards and say, show me some evidence. In the MOOC, we're saying, knock yourself out. Make it text if you want, video if you want to, within, you know, this is the file size, especially if you're on a small connection, try that. But you give us the evidence. We might get a lot more interesting stuff. A lot of this came sheeting home to me about a year ago. I was sitting having a coffee with someone, a good teacher at Deakin, who said, I'm doing this, 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 and this. I love it. But you know what? The students hate doing this assessment, and I hate marking it. I reckon we take up or use up about 85 cents in every dollar on assessment by the time you set, print, mark, deliver, mark, <coughs> calibrate, moderate, appeals, you get the idea. We tie up a great deal of our budget on assessment. There must be a better way. There must be. So I think we've got to be brave. So 
that's the model. I think in the end it comes back to this, and this is what our role is as the teaching and learning leaders, I think. Setting standards, accrediting standards, because that's what MOOCs don't take away, and never will, I think. We mentor standards, we mentor our colleagues to mentor their students to achieve the standards. And we use evidence to guide enhancement. And that, I think, is one of the great tools that an ADTL can use. So we call these people at Deakin a course director. You might call them a program leader or whatever you call them. The person looks after a whole degree. I think the key relationship is with that person. Looking at what are some of the tools that can help you get a snapshot of your curriculum at a course level. I heard you talking about the curtain tool just before I came in, so I thought I'd show you some updated pictures because I had a spare 10 minutes sometime a few uh, months ago and reworked that Excel spreadsheet. So it's starting to show more sophisticated pictures now, I think. It's a lot like the curtain tool where you're looking at the numbers and, and types of assessment in a whole course. Plus, if you multiply that by 24 or however many units, you can start to see colour patterns of the sorts of things that you give to students frequently. Essay report, essay report, essay report, draws your eye. High stakes assessment, that's where the marks are actually going. Very interesting when you have a look at a whole course like that. Here is one where we tried to map work integrated learning. So these are the assessments in a whole degree. We map them on two axes. How close to the professional context is it? Is it in the workplace or in the classroom, if I can put it that way? How closely does it simulate the sort of thing the student will do in their employed life or not? So this up here would be like a simulation. This would be a classroom test. Over here would be an internship type thing. Here would be a placement where they make the coffee and it's telling you something if it's there. So that's not perfect either, but it's all very difficult to judge work integrated learning across a whole degree. So we thought that was kind of interesting. And starting to ask questions like this. Do assessment tasks across the whole degree enable evidence for employability? Now, who makes this judgment? A person of about Q5 or 6 level, an admin person, somewhere in the team that I work with, will actually do this as a service for the faculties. That's not terribly expensive. That's not terribly expensive to get a person like that who can do it. It's an Excel spreadsheet. They get hold of the unit outlines or whatever you like to call them. Make consistent judgments because they do this all the time. They've had some training. They make an on-balance judgment from what they can read on the piece of paper because that's what the student gets. It's usually wrong because when it goes back to the staff, I go, oh, no, 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 you've completely misunderstood that. Great. We thought that was the case. But this is what's written on the paper. This is what your students get to read. So it gives the staff, if you like, a bit of a third party view of this is what it looks like. It's not scientific evidence. It's not a satellite map, it's a rough mud map. But it's a starting point for a conversation. How engaging are the learning experiences and so on. If you'd like more information on that, it's at Deacon Learning Futures on that website. Have a look. So, engineering change. I think we have challenging times already and probably more challenging <coughs> times ahead. And lots of fun as well, because it is fun. What does it mean for us? I jotted down in a very incomprehensible slide some of the things that I think help us do this job. I think we need a compelling model of teaching and learning. If we don't have some sort of pedagogical framework to pin things on, that we can evidence from the literature in teaching and learning, I think we're always going to argue the toss with staff. I have found the work of other ALTC fellows extremely helpful in this matter. When we devised the one, and Malcolm um, was certainly a colleague doing that, the, the one for, that you've been looking at for Deakin, we drew very much on David Bowd's assessment 2020 which was done by lots of people across the sector, led by David Bowd. He's got a fabulous handout at assessmentfutures.com. There is the evidence from the literature. He's a scholar in assessment, one of the best in the world. Peer assessment, why should you do it? There's all the evidence, draw on that. Jeff Crisp drew on his as well, e-assessment, what's the best elements of that? 
the fellows and the projects have given us really <coughs> good syntheses and often they will give us a two page, like not a cheat sheet exactly, but you know, here's the nub of what we found. That's a really good way to evidence and back up things because you're drawing on the best in the field. So I think we have to always draw on evidence, whether it's evidence of a course in a curriculum map or whatever it is, or evidence from the literature. We need academic credibility in teaching and learning. It is a field. I know it's weird, isn't it? We're happy to research anything else except the industry called higher education. It is a billion dollar industry. It's amazing. I think there's no escape, but leading teaching and learning, you have to do the hard yards. You have to write the documents, you have to make them look perfect, you have to reference them, you have to do the work. I can't see any way around it. You need to build teams and build their capability. Because when you build a team, I think it's about managing downwards, across and upwards as well. You need to build the next generation. You need to give people the tools and the academic reputation to take your place because you're not going to be there. What does that mean? What I'd like to do if I had a level B or C in my team is actually get them to a conference. Get them to a good conference. Get them to do a peer-reviewed paper at a conference for a start. Or a poster if that's where they're going to start. In teaching and learning. Because if these are tomorrow's leaders in teaching and learning, they will need credibility. Then when they've been to those, and by the way, no offence, but none of those conferences would be by informer, criterion, or liquid learning. I don't want my staff going to those. They're expensive, and really, they're just <coughs> the ALTC fellows and projects all turning up and providing the content, and others. So I don't think that's a good use of money. I'd rather spend the money and send the person to something where they're going to get a publishable outcome. Because I think... Teaching and publishing are the two things we have to try and keep doing. When I went to Deakin last year, I signed up and tutored in a large first year class. I didn't turn up a million times, but I did do it. It keeps you close to the chalk face, but it builds credibility as well. Publish, publish, publish as and when you can. With your peers, give other people a chance. Invite the younger staff to co-author with you. It builds their career. Seek peer endorsement, and I don't mean just through LinkedIn. I found over the years that seeking awards, OLTC citations for teams who build things like curriculum maps and evaluate and all that sort of thing, it builds kudos, it builds profile. It's peer reviewed awards. It works. I think it's good. Communicate, communicate, and then communicate again. And always try, I think, with consistent visual language. I would well understand if Malcolm's eyes rolled into his head if he has to look at those slides one more time. I keep using the same pictures. It's consistent, visual. I happen to be a very visual person. I try to tell stories with pictures, but keep the pictures similar because people are trying to latch on to what we're saying. Use national frameworks and networks, and I've got the hitch your wag wagon to the bandwagon. Here's an example. The work I was doing a few years ago was very much in graduate attributes. Then the talk was all about standards, and I thought, well, there's a natural link. Attributes and standards. I'll hitch my work to the bandwagon, and I'm not meaning that to be pejorative. That's the policy issue of the day. So how do we actually attach ourselves to that? Because that's what's going to get attention. That's what DVCs and VCs are worried about, because that's what they get asked when they meet. So how can you actually provide that? Stick with the core values. I tried to focus on that when we start. Why do students enrol? How do they learn? What's it like for them? Because if it doesn't work for them, it's probably not going to work for us. Your, T your TLC online, your teaching learning centre, great. Network of networks. Don't reinvent the wheel. Link to other people's stuff. Great. And of course, because it's for your discipline or clusters of disciplines, people will go to it. Ask them to share stuff with you. Share, share, share and like. Show examples, prototypes, manage up, across and down. I think financial literacy is really important. We do need financial literacy. I, I think we're weak on it in teaching and learning. When we think, oh, I'll put a Google Hangout in this, or I won't do those lectures anymore, I'll actually run 15 shoots instead. Well, don't we just send the school board? I don't think we're really that strong, and I say we. 
I don't think we're as strong on financial literacy, what it costs to deliver this kind of teaching and learning. I think that's where we need to work with our colleagues as well. Maybe you're, you're strong in your institution on that, or maybe not, no? I think it's a gap for us. In fact, I think it would be a great project if someone did that. For the OLT, for example. She warns down again, just to hear. Right. That might be, well, if financial, you know, delivering good learning in financially constrained times, that would get a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. The last point I'll make is whatever you do, try and get it written into policy, <coughs> national and institutional. Because when it's written down, it becomes LAW law, and then you've got something to help you drive. Rather than, well, here's my good idea today, put it out there, it sort of disappears, falls off the national conversation or the local conversation. If it's written down, if it's in policy, you've got a chance of it lasting. Because it takes time to undo policy. It doesn't take long to undo practice. So those are some thoughts. I hope that's really helpful and interesting. I think that must be the end. I thought I had another last slide, but it's got something. So I might stop there. I'm very happy to take comments, complaints, questions, ideas. If there's anyone still awake, I'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.